Welcome to KJV Cafe, where we explore great truths from God's holy word in a simple, down-to-earth fashion. Romans 10:17 shows us where faith comes from. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's grow our faith together in the cafe today. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. Grab your Bible and a hot cup of coffee or tea and join us now as we explore God's holy word. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Pastor Clark Covington here today with another great message for you. And this one will make you think. I promise you it'll have you, uh, I don't know, if scratching your head or not, or kind of, uh, you know, rolling those eyes up to the corner uh, one way or another saying, what is that about? But I'm telling you, this will make you think. Uh, last week, our family was on vacation. Uh, we typically take a vacation, um, our little summer vacation the week before school starts if we can. And I was doing my morning Bible study uh, uh, in the book of John, and I was in John chapter 6. And anytime I'm in John chapter 6, I think about John 666, which is uh, the mark of the beast, the number of the devil, amen, 666, amen. And also John 666 speaks to how many chose not to follow Jesus anymore. And uh, you can get in and read that about how Jesus was telling them things that was hard for them to understand, that they shouldn't follow him for the miracles, and that they were following him, frankly, just for free food, essentially, uh, because he was feeding the multitudes, that they should follow him because he is the Son of God. And he actually tells them that they're going to have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. And many said that's just too difficult to deal with, and so they walked away. They didn't follow him anymore. And so John 6, 6, 6 shows how the devil can get to people and make them question their faith and and, and make them seek comfort over Christ-like lifestyle and behavior. But if you go past John 6, 6, just a little bit, John chapter 6, verse 66, you get to verse 70 of John 6, which says, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. Verse 71. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. And so after this incident where many of the disciples walk away, uh, the Lord asks the disciples, you know, are you guys going to leave as well? I mean, I'll just read it here for you. Uh, John 6, verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. And so we see here Jesus questioning the loyalty of the disciples, were they going to stay? And they said, and Peter, of course, says, yes, we're going to stay. You are the Christ. Peter had belief. Amen. But then Jesus responds with this head scratcher. Have I not chosen you? Right? Have I not chosen you? And earlier in John 6, the Lord mentions that that you can't come to God unless the Lord has chosen you to come to God. Amen. Uh, and and that's, that's Bible scripture. In fact, I believe it is here in John 6 verse... Uh, 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. This is Jesus speaking here. And him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. Verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And so later on, Jesus is recapping that, saying, I picked you. But then here's the head scratcher. He says, I chose you 12 and one of you is a devil. And the question I have for you today is why did Jesus, the living God, who knows the hearts of people, right, who knows everything, Why did he choose Judas to be a disciple? I mean, think about this. God knows everything. He knows the hearts of everyone. Why would he choose Judas Iscariot as a disciple? Why let the betrayer into his inner circle? You think about that. Why would the Lord himself allow a betrayer in that inner circle that would manipulate, that would eventually betray him uh, and, and lead him to the cross? God's ways are beyond comprehension. <laughs> His plan is so poetic and effective, yet so unusual and awe-inspiring. 
Who else could take a wicked man and have him centrally involved in the salvation plan for all mankind, yet not leave him to go unpunished? So let's dig in here and see if we can figure out why the Lord would have chosen Judas to be a disciple. Here are some facts about Judas. Let's start with our investigation with who was Judas Iscariot, the who of the matter. Let's start there. He was one of the 12 disciples. We know that. That's what Jesus said. He was in charge of the treasury, which he'd later steal from. Think about this. If you knew the heart of man and you knew that there was one that was wicked and would betray you, not only would you not want to put them in, their inner, in your inner circle, but you certainly wouldn't want to put them in charge of the treasury. You imagine a preacher that knows there's some wicked man in his congregation says, hey, I'm going to make you a deacon and I'm going to make you in charge of the money. You know, that's not going to happen, which speaks to maybe what God thinks about money. But it's another, another topic, but still fascinating. So he was in charge of the tre- treasury, which he'd later steal from. He's a, he's a thief. He lived with and followed Jesus for three years. We understand uh, the best to our knowledge, uh, the best research I've done is that he lived with and followed Jesus three years like the disciples did in Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, there were other important men named Judas in the Bible. For example, Jesus' half-brother and another disciple. Therefore, Judas is referred to as Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. This is to ensure we know who's who. So oftentimes when you read about this particular individual, his full name's there, Judas Iscariot, and then son of Simon. So there's no doubt this is the betrayer, or sometimes the Bible will say the betrayer, the one that betrayed him. What did he betray Jesus for? 30 silver coins. That's Matthew 26, 13 through 15. We understand in John 13, 10 through 11, that Judas was not saved. He was empowered by Satan to betray Jesus. We see this in John 13, 27. He betrayed Jesus with a kiss. I mean, think about, is there any worse way to betray someone? You know, who do you kiss? I mean, I don't kiss many people, praise God, but I'll kiss my wife and my kids and I love them. Can you imagine someone giving you a kiss and betraying you? Uh, And he did not repent. Judas was remorseful. He gave the silver back, the blood money, and he hung himself uh, in what would be called uh, the field of blood, amen. But he was not he was not repentant. So remorseful and repentant mean two different things. And this can be found in Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Judas fulfilled prophecy in the Bible. Psalm 41, 9. Now remember, Psalms are in the Old Testament, right? Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. We see also here in Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So Zechariah is foretelling Jesus' betrayal for 30 pieces of silver. Acts 1, 18 through 19. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, Akaladama, that is to say, the field of blood. And you can go there today. There is an Akaladama today. There is a Greek Orthodox monastery or church there on the site, but you can visit that place. Amen. I always love looking up these Bible places, these real true places uh, online and seeing, because I can't go there, amen, not right now at least, seeing the pictures. And you can see it, it literally, there is a field and a valley and it's right there. You can still go there today, the field of blood. And there's an ironic twist where they, so, so Judas throws the blood money back to the priest that had paid him to betray Jesus and says, I, I don't want this. I've, I've done wrong. You know, he's remorseful. The priests say, well, this is blood money. They admit what they've done, basically. They can't take it. So what do they do? They buy a field. And that's the potter's field, the field of blood, uh, Akladama. And that's where Judas hangs himself. And so you have the field that they buy, and you have the place that Judas commits suicide being the same place. <clears throat> and by the way, let me just say this for a second. You know, in the scriptures, it says that Judas is a devil. Uh, Jesus says that himself, amen, in our text verse in John 6, verse 70. You know, think about this for a minute. You think about how the devil used Judas, right? He indwelled him to betray Jesus Christ. Then when 
Everything goes wrong. Where is the devil to back him up? Nowhere. What happens to Judas? He gives the money back. He's humiliated. He He's used in the plan of salvation uh, and, and not, in, not in the good way for him. Amen. He's eternally punished. Uh, he kills himself. You know, that's what the devil will do. You know, the wages of sin is death, by the way. And we see this so perfectly illustrated in the life of Judas. He sinned. He faces death. And that old liar, that old slippery serpent, the devil, is nowhere to be found when he's hanging on a tree. I just want to put that out there in case the devil's tempting you today to make you think something is desirable that it's not. Another one would be Adam and Eve. The devil beguiled, tricked Adam and Eve. They ate of that forbidden fruit. They had been in this perfect garden. They did not know death. They did not have any fear. They didn't even know that they were naked. Amen. And when they ate of that fruit, they were expelled from that garden and things got very, very difficult for them. Again, they were tricked by the devil. What else about Judas? He's an unbeliever. John 6, 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now, this is very important, okay? Because John 6, 64 is telling us that Jesus knew some didn't believe. And that also is linked in there with betrayal. And we need to realize that belief is incredibly important in God's program. It is the most important thing we can do, <clears throat> really the only thing we can do. If you say, Brother Clark, I want to go to heaven, so I'm giving all my money to this charity, or I'm going to help, um, I'm going to help old folks at the grocery all day long, or I'm going to uh, give away all my possessions to the poor, or I'm going to uh, enter the ministry full time, and I'm going to be a great evangelist, whatever you think you might do for God, right? is in your own power and is an affront to God. The Bible tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. As I understand that translation, it means like dirty gauze pads. That's what God thinks of our righteousness. And so we realize through the scriptures, Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us it's impossible to please God without faith. Well, what's the inverse of that? If we have faith, we please God. Amen. You want to please God today? Have faith. What does that mean? Believe on God. Did Judas believe? He did not believe. Could a believer have played the role that Judas played? Could a believer have betrayed Jesus Christ? I believe there is no way a true believer with the Holy Spirit indwelling them could have done what Judas had done. Now, again, we don't need to speculate. It clearly says here in John 6, 64, there were some that believed not. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So we don't need to speculate. But truly, a believer would not be able to do what Judas did. I don't think. Amen. So we need to realize the role that faith plays in living a godly life. And conversely, the dangers of not having faith in our Christian walk. Because Judas, did he look like a Christian? You betcha. Think about this. Let's say you're in a town and Jesus comes with his 12 disciples. Can you discern which one is the devil? <clears throat> the other disciples didn't even know. At the Last Supper, they were asking who, which one is it, you know? If, if, if you're in a town and they come in, he looks like a believer like anyone else. He looks like a Christian like anyone else. But God knew. God knew. And so God knows us, amen, by the way. He knows our heart, our mind, our soul. He knows what we're up to. He knows if we're playing church or not, amen. We have to realize the role that faith plays in living a godly life and the dangers of not having faith and trying to walk a Christian walk. Because they're, you're saying, Brother Clark, oh, I believe, I go to church, I read my Bible, but do you really believe that is between you and the Lord? Judas was a thief, John 12, 4 through 6. And then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Here in John 12, 4 through 6, we're told in very authoritative terms that Ju Judas is a thief. And he was referring to the ointment, the very precious ointment that was put on Jesus' feet with, with the woman's hair, amen. And, and Judas is saying, oh, this ointment could have been sold. But Jesus knew his heart and knew that he was a thief. He just desired all of that money to be in the bag so that he could steal it. <clears throat> doesn't say that he could be a thief or he might have been a thief or he had... He had thoughts to steal. It said he was a thief. So that for me is enough to tell us this man's a thief. 
<laughs> which is crazy again. So you have a thief in the inner circle of God and God's like, okay, I'll make that one the treasurer. You know, it just, you just have to think, I mean, the Bible is, is, is um, unbelievably deep, right? There are so many layers to it. And sometimes, again, I, we were at the beach and I'm just sitting there, maybe not in my normal study. So I'm just thinking a little bit outside the box, I guess. Sometimes you have to think outside the box and just ask the question, why? Why would the Lord do this? Well, secondly here, this is the why. Jesus Christ did this. Why Jesus chose Judas to fulfill his plan. What did Jesus come for? He came to offer salvation for all mankind. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, or made alive by the Spirit. We see the just for the unjust. That would be Christ sinless and perfect. Remember, he's born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life, God in the flesh, dying for our sins. And we have many, amen. And we're all sinful. That's hereditary from Adam and Eve, who I mentioned earlier, amen. So we have a sin debt we can't pay. Christ dies for our sins and is buried and risen again on the third day, according to the scriptures, as 1 Corinthians 15, one through four clearly points out. We look to that. We say, Lord, we believe you. We look to God's passion, Christ's passion on the cross. We believe we had a need. We believe we could not pay it. We believe Christ died, was buried, and was risen again, which is sometimes very hard to believe that God himself raised one from the dead, who in fact is part of himself, amen, and that when we believe on him, we get the Holy Spirit, which makes up the Holy Trinity. We believe it. We believe it. We suspend logic or intellect or flesh that tells us not to, and we believe it. When we do that, we're saved. The just for the unjust. But also, Christ was the just, and he was betrayed by the unjust, was he not? And so God poetically puts this in his plan. You think about this. John one twenty nine, a very familiar verse. This is speaking of John the Baptist here. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Have you ever thought about this verse? Why is John the Baptist calling Jesus the Lamb of God? That's alluding to this sacrifice that I've just explained. It's alluding to Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. So it is like John the Baptist saying to Jesus, Hey, here's the one that's going to die for mankind so that they can live. But this plan had to be brought about some way. So Father God needed one to betray the Son to enact the perfect sacrifice, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This then creates the free gift of salvation, as I've mentioned, clearly explained in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, or as we walk through it in Romans Road. This puts this into motion, amen, or keeps it in motion. God tells us that Judas is held responsible for his actions. I don't want you to think that, that Judas is being lifted up here as somebody uh, that is worthy of commendation. No, they're worthy, uh, they're worthy of condemnation. They're worthy of punishment. Matthew 26, 24 tells us this. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Is this not clearly addressing that Judas will be the one that will be punished for what he did to the Lord. Amen. And so we see here, beyond Judas, we see here our own need to get right with God. Acts 3, 17 through 19. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You know, we are to repent. We are, we are not to look at Judas and say, oh, he's so wicked. I'm glad I'm good. No, we are to look at him and say, woe unto those that betray the Lord. This one did it literally, but we're capable of doing it in our own life, right? I mean, think about, again, Judas himself didn't just crucify Christ. The high priest, the Jews, his own people, the ones he came to be Messiah to save, amen. As I understand it, Jesus' ministry was primarily to the Jews, and they rejected him, amen, and they wanted to kill him themselves. So they said, no, we need to get the Romans to do that. It's against our law. So they have to get the Romans to do that. They used Judas in the plot to get it going. And so all of these folks are involved. So who crucified Jesus? All different types of people. And who today 
are living uh, uh, far off from God, living in rebellion to God, rejecting Jesus Christ's free gift of salvation, all different types of people, amen? There is much to learn from this. And God, again, poetically shows our inability to save ourselves, okay? So the justice that came from God through what man thought would kill God himself all the more created a plan for all to be saved that would come to saving knowledge of him. I mean, think about it. Step one, man thinks he's going to kill God, right? Man thinks he's going to kill God. Of course, the devil's very involved in this. Secondly, God responds with everlasting life to all that believe on him, right? So God uses death to create life. Man is made to look all the more depraved and foolish in dire need of salvation. You know, I mean, think about it. Because how are we saved? By what Christ did on the cross. How did what Christ did on the cross come to fruition? By Judas' betrayal. And so how did Judas get involved? Who gave him the 30 pieces of silver, right? Who hung Christ on the cross? We see all different parties involved. And yet there is one singular idea at hand here, and that is the plan of salvation. God poetically, artfully, skillfully, brilliantly weaves together the salvation plan through man's own wickedness. It's unbelievable, and it could only be of God. No one could ever think of su such a thing. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you, being dead in your sins and on the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And so we see here in verse 15 of Colossians 2, this exact principle that the Lord himself spoiled principalities, amen, powers, that would be uh, the elites, but it would also be the devil. He broke the devils back at Calvary and he made a show of them openly. He literally used their wickedness to create the greatest love story of all mankind. He, he, and yet at the same time, they're still repaid for their wickedness. The attempted murder of God by his own creation led to the chance for everlasting life for his creation. How poetic. It reminds me really honestly of how man thinks and how God thinks and how God's ways are so much greater than man's ways. You know, think of that time uh, when in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus is preparing for the Passion, he's going to go through Samaria, he sends messengers up there, and they say no, because they don't want anything to do with Jew the Jews and the Samaritans getting, didn't get along at all. And so the disciples respond here in, in Luke 9, uh, verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Wow. So they're saying, let's blow up the Samaritans. And verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And so here we see man's... Uh, Pension for vengeance, right? Pension for getting a pound of flesh. Man's idea of killing and destruction. And Jesus Christ's love and forgiveness, even though it, it, it would have been an insult, it's making things inconvenient and all these other things. Christ is saying, I didn't come to blow them up and consume them. I came to give them life, to save them. Amen. And so we see the power in, in the ways of God is so much greater than really we could often fathom. And But we ask again, you know, you should ask, I ask, why did Jesus pick Judas? Because he needed to bring about the plan of salvation, which God the Father had ordained, which really the triune God had ordained before the world even began, because God is not surprised. There's no surprises in heaven. And we learn so much from this. We learn to submit. You know, we have today only to consider what God did for us. Tomorrow may never come. It's too late for Judas, by the way. Let's consider God's superior knowledge and power and submit to, to him today fully. You know, fear the Lord, amen. Fear the Lord. God's power, if God could use a wicked man like Judas in such a way, what is too hard for God? And if you fall into sin, are you above him holding you accountable? He held Judas accountable. He'll hold you accountable. 
Don't deceive and don't be deceived. Looks can deceive. Judas looked the part, but inwardly he was never saved and born again. Let us not be deceptive to others thinking God doesn't know. Don't play church, amen. Don't live like in a way that um, the image created looks good and inwardly it is rotten. God knows. God looks upon the heart, amen. It's better to look to look not so great, but in the heart be okay, amen. Uh, and, and that is the truth. Amen. If you got to pick one or the other, don't worry about the vain things. Uh, there's even a scripture in the Bible about exercise. that profits really nothing, uh, but spiritual exercise profits everything. It's very similar to that. We must get right with God. We must realize that our Lord is smarter than us and more powerful than us and has a great loving plan for us and that sent his only begotten Jesus to die on the cross for us, and that we could accept him as the risen Christ, that he, that he was nailed to that cross, suffered the most brutal death of all, of all time, amen, drank of that bitter cup of sin for you and for me, and that uh, was buried three days, was risen again on the third day, and walked the earth 40 days and 40 nights, it was seen by over 500, and ascended up to the Father, and today is alive and well at the right hand of the Father intercessing for us, the mediator for us, those that believe on him. When we understand this, we realize we are serving a living God with a definite plan that is still in in action today, that God is not surprised by anything happening in the world, that everything is still on track, because if he could use Judas, the treasurer, amen, one of his disciples, to bring about the salvation plan and yet still punish Judas, what can God not do? Let's turn to him today. And let's do things like ask these questions more often and research them to see what thus saith the word of God, because it is powerful, amen, and it'll, it'll change your life. It'll help you understand it. Again, in a good way, help you fear the Lord and grow closer to him. But do you fear him today? I mean, think about that. You know, the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. The Bible clearly instructs us over and over again to fear the Lord. Uh, I was reading in the Psalms this morning about seeking the Lord and fearing the Lord and seeking the Lord and fearing the Lord. David writes about it. We need to fear God. And what that means is that it informs our life, you know, that we take sin very seriously. You know, there is temptation all over the place. And you walk in uh, to a department store and you see something you know you can't afford and you in your heart say, if I just had that, I'd be so happy. That's a sin, amen. You go to the gym, somebody of the opposite uh, sex is wearing something uh, revealing, and you know not to look, but you look, that's a sin, amen. You slip off and go and gamble online or at the casino. You know, you're at a party and you say, hey, one, one drink won't kill me, one or two drinks won't kill me, and I might not be of a sober mind, but who will know? You lie at work or you take something you're not supposed to. I could go on and on. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit will convict you of it. I believe it. But we need to fear the Lord. We, You know, Job said this, I will not look upon a maid in the book of Job. And that, that was, in a way, him saying, I know better than to fall into the sin because I fear God. And oh, did Job fear God after God showed up to the party, amen, and, and let Job know who he was and how he created the earth and how he has all knowledge. And Job was literally covering his mouth saying, I cannot speak. And that's Job. Uh, one of the most righteous people to ever live. How about us here today? Amen. All of us. We need to have a fear for the Lord. If Judas had feared the Lord, he would have never done what he had done. I believe it. And the Lord would have saved him. I believe it. But there was not a fear for the Lord. We need to fear God. He is real. He's alive and he's all knowing and he loves us and he wants to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. But let's never take that love uh, as a weakness and let's never take it for granted. But let's fear God as he deserves to be feared and let's reverence him and let's serve him with all our heart, soul, and mind till the day he calls us home. I thank you so much for listening today and tune in next time as we get to more great truths in the Bible. Take care, God bless, and amen. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of KJV Cafe. Have a question for Pastor Clark? Email him directly at clark at enduringpromise.org or visit kjvcafe.com and click the envelope button on the homepage. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. We'll close today with Psalm 119, verses 166 through 168. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee.